All right, good evening, everybody, or uh, if you're watching this recorder, good morning or good afternoon, whatever it happens to be for you when you watch this. So I'd like to welcome you to the February uh, meeting of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers Atlanta Metro Chapter uh, in our PDH presentation for the tonight. Uh, for tonight will be given to us by uh, Professor May Wayne, a uh, family friend. So uh, hopefully everybody will enjoy. And with that, I will turn it over to May to give a better introduction of herself. So take it away, May. Thank you. First of all, thank Steve and uh, GTPE for inviting me to speak. I'm truly delighted to have an opportunity to share with you uh, what's going on in the state of art in uh, big data and uh, AI for precision medicine. So if you look at uh, uh, this uh, block diagram, this is my title slides, but they carry a lot of meanings. So we're looking at uh, big data and AI for precision medicine. Really, it's actually based upon uh, two fundamental state of art uh, uh, academic disciplines. So one is uh, biomedical engineering and one is biomedical informatics. So if you think about what is the role of engineering, it's playing a role to provide the tools to enable the individual and the population ultimately to achieve what we call p health. Ideally, we want to be able one day to not only we can actually predict what's going to happen, predict what's happened to each individual of us, but also we want to be able to be part of it by participating. And also we want to have a precise uh, projection what our house looks like. So as I already said that, biomedical engineer is the one providing the tools for us to be there. So what exactly the role of biomedical informatics? So if you think about a chemical reaction, anything you put above the arrow is a catalyst. That's exactly the role of biomedical and health informatics. It's actually the accelerator. That's the accelerator the process. It's the enabler making possible possible. Meanwhile, it's a hub. It's the place where you can actually unite the data and also you can unite the people behind the data. So biomedical big data and AI are definitely founded and built upon those two fundamental, what we call the cornerstone of the modern uh, biotechnology. So well, let me actually get into, before I get into the detail, I want to have an opportunity to acknowledge all the sponsors who make uh, this research uh, possible. So not only we're sponsored by the uh, federal government, such as the National Institute of Health, National Science Foundation, US CDC, but also we're directly supported by the state of Georgia, like a Georgia Cancer Coalition, and Georgia Research Alliance. In addition, where our research are funded by Coder Foundation, uh, currently this is the, the Coder Foundation is the name for my department. I'm part of Biomedical Engineer Department of Georgia Tech and Emory. And meanwhile, we have uh, uh, Enduring Heart Foundation and uh, also uh, two uh, private foundation who funded our research. Uh, Gagio Leo Family Breast Cancer Innovation Fund and the Kara and the David Flanagan Family Fund. Uh, last but not the least is actually our research is firmly grounded in the real clinical medicine. So that's why I do want to uh, acknowledge the two translational partners for us. One is the industry, one is the hospital. So we're funded uh, by uh, multiple like uh, industry partners Amazon, Johnson Johnson, Hilo Packard, Microsoft, UCB. Meanwhile, we're actually uh, grounded because we work with the uh, uh, frontline physicians together at Emory, Grady, University of Pennsylvania, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, as well as the Shriner Hospital for Children. So with that, I want now to get into the uh, detail. So I want to have a chance to introduce you about uh, uh, our department. In fact, I'm actually a Georgia Tech alumni. I graduated with my PhD from Georgia Tech uh, and, and electrical engineer, and I got my master's degree from computer science and uh, applied math. 
So while I was a student at Georgia Tech, there was no such department called biomedical engineering. So around 1997-1998, uh, Georgia Tech and Emory decided to jointly form this new department. Uh, back then, there are multiple uh, joint program in between institutions. For example, MIT and Harvard has a pro joint program. UC Berkeley and the UC San Francisco has a joint program. However, it is indeed Georgia Tech and Emory are the first uh, two joint department, two university, one is a private medical school, one is a public uh, uh, college engineering, decided jointly from this new department. As of today, we actually are really an uh, entity uh, prominent on both Georgia Tech and Emory campuses. At Georgia Tech, if you drive uh, to the uh, this main court and uh, next to the uh, bas the basketball uh, baseball field, you're going to see on this quad, quad there's four buildings. Uh, BME has a dedicated building uh, here uh, next to the main campus uh, drive, and my office and my lab happen to be in the fourth fourth floor of this building. Meanwhile. At the Emory campus, we also have a BME building here. So currently, uh, we have a, a 70 tenure track faculty member plus the 70 research faculty member. Uh, in addition to that, we have a close to 50 staff as well as a, a 13 professional track faculty. Professional track faculty used to refer to the professors who actually are we recruited back from industry who help us do translational research. Currently, uh, within like uh, uh, less than 20 years, uh, our program became a uh, top three in the country. Our undergrad and the graduate program, one is number two, one is number three. Uh, in one year, our undergrad was even uh, number one. So currently, we are uh, in the tight, uh, like tie with the uh, uh, Duke University, uh, UC San, Fran uh, San Diego, uh, a few top uh, program. Uh, we're trying to catch up with uh, uh, John Hopkins, who is number one at this moment. So we are graduating more than 1,000. We have more than 1,000 undergrad. It's the largest biomedical engineering department in the whole country. Uh, and also, we have uh, the largest uh, graduate program. We are also have the largest number of faculties in the whole country. So in our department, we have a multiple uh, focuses. So from neural engineering, cancer technology, immunoengineering, cardiovascular engineering, drug delivery and uh, cellular delivery, uh, biomaterial regenerative technology. And the last uh, uh, few years, our emphasis were to grow hardcore engineering disciplines, such as the biomedical imaging and instrumentation, uh, biomedical informatics and the system modeling, and also biomedical robotics. So my area is uh, in this area. So basically, uh, right now, at this moment, this is my department chair, Dr. Susan Margulies. She is actually newly elected into the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, she gave me the slide. Uh, so uh, currently, we're in the middle of developing AI uh, for healthcare. Uh, I'm in the middle of uh, uh, leading this effort, uh, trying to establish. So with that, I want to now get into some more broader scheme behind what I'm going to talk about today. I want to talk about the uh, Georgia Tech has an institute for people and technology. This institute was led by Professor Elizabeth Mannett. And basically, we have a four thrust in this uh, uh, institute. One is related to interoperable health IT in the cloud. One is in powered ubiquitous health. Uh, one is on large data analytics. And one is on modeling and the simulation. So basically, if you look at uh, what kind of uh, uh, the scope spectrum we're looking into, it's indeed it's a wide spectrum. From the sensor to clinical data, personal data and to the app development for patient engagement, assisted robotics, aging, and also in terms of analytics, we look into behavior imaging, personalized healthcare, 
and the discovery of new medical evidence and to the modeling, such as care delivery optimization, process-based design uh, for health IT, as well as novel system uh, uh, simulation. Uh, again, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Manet for sharing the slides. In addition to that, we have another major initiative. This is in pediatric uh, initiative, in point of care and AI. So we have a few leaders, uh, Sherry Frugia, Lee and West, they're the one leading on the Georgia Tech side, and Dr. Kevin Meyer, who is leading on the uh, Pediatric Innovation Center on the Chur side. So we are actually also in the middle of developing the novel devices, analytics, and process improvement, and totally uh, together combining with some uh, fundamental technology, such as nanotechnology, decision support, and regenerative medicine. We're hoping to be able in this uh, uh, arm, we try to deliver the solution in shorter time because most of the biomedical engineer, uh, the cycle is very long. So we want to speed up the development from the idea to the final clinical practice. So we are involved in helping a couple of uh, the uh, effort here also. So I'm listing this here for one reason. I want to share with you that I am day by day working in an interdisciplinary environment. So as a result of it, uh, quickly, what I'm sharing today is not my only personal view, but in fact, it is actually joint wisdom coming from the larger community I'm involved. So in fact, about more than a decade ago, uh, I actually first uh, decided to move from the fundamental data analysis to go beyond for major healthcare initiative. I was actually inspired by this particular plot. By that, that time, the first time I saw it was about 13 years ago. So at that time, I, had, I have seen data around the, here. At least we spent it seeing more data. So I was very like shocked the first time when I was invited to a workshop and then I learned the a reality of what a U.S. healthcare in comparison to the whole world. If you look at uh, the U.S. healthcare, what exactly the issue? Let me actually um, emphasize, make it bigger. So the big issue is we're talking about the healthcare cost. It's a way above all of the developed countries in the whole world. So that's why if we start in deeper, what's the reason behind it? One of the major reason is this missile like what's happening on our society. It's an aging society. So people are living longer and longer. As a result of that, the healthcare goes higher. So it's already, it goes up to so high that it's close to $9,000 per capita. As a result of that, if, the, if we keep having this curve going up continuously without a strategy to turn this around, very quickly, our country will be broke. So that's the reason why. Uh, back around the 2007, uh, that's actually around the time I uh, like uh, joined, uh, I was invited to a workshop and learned this. Uh, the country all recognized this challenge. So as a result of it, the Institute of Medicine, currently it's renamed as National Academy of Medicine, but it used to be called uh, Institute of Medicine. They are being charged to figure out what is the solution for this national challenge. So as a result of it, there are many, many issues. Uh, I'm just listing a few related technology. So basically, the key is to solve this problem. We need to actually figure out the best evidence, make it evidence-based medicine, not just empirical experience-based medicine, but evidence-based medicine. We're not only need to actually follow the medical protocol, but also we want to individualize for each patient to improve the efficacy. And also, instead of always doing reverse engineer to fix a broken body when the person gets sick, we want to go into the prevention and the health promotion to prevent this from happening. And in addition to that, we want to focus on deliver the value, not just the service. And lastly, 
we need to be able to learn from the deliverer, right? So this actually is what's the solution proposed back then. Let's do a reality check. What happened five years after that? Five years after the prescription was given and the country has started doing meaningful use, started uh, pushing for possibility of uh, addressing each of the five uh, solutions. So what is the reality? The reality is our healthcare outcome is still the 37, the lowest among all the developed countries. Our healthcare cost is still number one. So what is that is the reason? So that's why Institute of Medicine went back to double check what's going on. Why we have a prescription? Uh, we are starting addressing one of the, the all the, the issues. We're still end up so low. So in fact, there are three reasons are related to science and technology. So the first one is a poorly managed insight. In terms of medical science research, US is still number one in the whole world. Unfortunately, for science to come into final translation to be utilized, it's actually in US, it's not effective at all. Uh, a lot of time we read from news. Some basic discovery was done by US, but it's actually finally being materialized in Germany, in Japan. Uh, that's actually partially is related to this major issue. The second issue is a poorly utilized evidence. And so we are actually having so many instruments being developed. Unfortunately, we do, we do not capture the best evidence based on those uh, instruments and technology. And the third one is a poorly captured experience. So during the care. So this is an interesting one. Uh, back then, I still remember when we were in discussion, this uh, sounds very strange, uh, like a feedback initially. Uh, after the discussion, uh, we actually got it was one of the reasons. So in the US, the because we have a, a big, uh, like a law uh, system behind it, the healthcare, as a result of it, if you go to a hospital, the physician, everyone, healthcare worker, the number one they want to do is make sure they follow the protocol. If during the uh, saving a patient, there's some particular procedure done on the spot based on experience, you did it. If it's outside the protocol, it's poorly captured in the electronic medical record or the healthcare system to help you go back to evaluate why this one works better than the other. So all these are the major issues. So that's why I want to actually now go back to talk about, based on that kind of a, a second diagnosis, we come back to what exactly technology should do, can do, so we can actually address this issue. Among all kinds of technologies, I'm actually only going to fo focus on big data and AI. So what exactly is big data? Uh, after I received my PhD from Georgia Tech, I worked in the formal uh, Lucent Technology Bell Labs for a few years. So I used to work on multimedia computing. So that's why I initially, when I first heard about the big data, I do not like this uh, uh, terminology at all because big is a relative term. Uh, back then, uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, I used the gigabytes of data. Now, uh, I have a petabyte data, right? So big is a relative term. So what exactly the definition of a uh, uh, big data? So this is what I may mean by the uh, big data. The first one is definitely still related to volume, uh, the big, the size, but more importantly, there are a few other V words. So the next one is uh, variety. So this is unique uh, about uh, uh, medicine where uh, I, as I mentioned, I used to work on multimedia, right? We work on the uh, images, audio, video, uh, the text. But in the medicine, we not only have imaging, we have a, a sensor, but also a lot of time we have handwritten notes from the physician, right? So that's why this itself presents a huge challenge. In addition to that, there's another V word called the velocity. 
which means that for the even for the different patient, they have a similar uh, symptom. They are being checked on completely different time interval. So that's why the data are being checked in different time interval. Uh, I'm just writing uh, the like cartoon here, right? So if you look at the blood pressure versus heart rate, it's being checked on a different one. So this actually presents an issue when you put the data together, trying to analyze it. If they are acquired at different time interval, at different uh, uh, speed, would that be able to be utilized reliably? The next V word is veracity, which actually stands for the quality issue. As I already shared with you that, the physician note is a, a very major issue now in the uh, in the world, not just in US, right? So I'm going to show you some statistics done by CDC in the uh, following slides. But I want to tell you that this presents a big challenge, right? And in addition to that, when you actually have an electronic medical record, typically it's going to miss at least 25, 30% of the data. And if you have an instrument itself, calibration related, uh, the data acquisition process related, you also have noises in those data. So that's the veracity. The next one is value. So basically, right now, we keep saying, because of medical engineering, we develop so many devices. Now we can acquire the data. We can measure what's happening on a person. However, data doesn't help. Uh, volume of uh, raw data doesn't help at all. What's really important is how do we extract metadata from the raw data how do we actually extract the knowledge from the metadata? How we can finally make a, a decision? Ideally, this is an actionable decision. So that's what we call value. Value coming from the raw data, right? So all these five V become what's called biomedical big data. On top of that, because it's related to health, there's another major issue. That's the data security and the privacy issue. So that's why composed all together these complex and unstructured data itself that's called a biomedical big data so that's actually well adopted right now in our community so now what is ai so ai is fundamentally we are having this the this pipeline itself the work data flow has never changed it has been like this since 30 some years ago when I first started working on AI. Nowadays, we're still having exactly the same uh, AI uh, pipeline. So basically, it's the one I just shared in the early last slide. It's coming from the raw data. You extract the features, we call extract the information. You get to the knowledge, and then you go to the actionable uh, decision, right? So you can actually not only have decision, how, but also go to action. So what exactly it means? This itself never changed. But what's really it means behind it? So this is what it means behind it. So basically, every time we're talking about the data, we're referring to kind of a data-related issue. One is called experimental design for the related uh, uh, how you acquire the data for training your model. One is the data quality, as I already mentioned. What if you have missing data? What if you have a terrible handwriting, right? So those are the data quality issues. And then you have raw data, you want to extract the information metadata features out of the raw data. Uh, based on that, you want to ideally link to the medical knowledge because the medicine itself is a knowledge intensive field. And then you go to the decision making. In this whole process, you also have one more thing, which is you need a feedback, right? So this whole process itself, I can share with you, it has never changed. However, what's the reality in the current medicine practice? This is the one thing I want to share with you, statistics. This was done by American Medical Informatics Association some years ago. They actually said that since the 1960s, after the computer were invented and being started applied to medical uh, practice, well, first, when the computer-aided diagnosis system was developed, one of the major, major challenges after half a century is majority of the system are not being put in the real clinical use. So what's the missing element? Actually, the missing element happened to be the knowledge modeling. 
because a lot of the computer systems are designed and developed by computer scientists, so and also computer engineers. As a result of it, it's actually once you get the feature, you apply, put it into a machine learning black box, you jump into decision making. You do not really link to the knowledge. As a result of it, the practitioner uh, practicing physicians, they're not going to use it. So this has become a, one of the major issues. Right now, while AI is getting into its fourth wave right now, we're all start looking into this to make sure this time, we're going to have a, a few successful stories using AI for biomedicine and health. We need to link this with knowledge, which I'm going to comment towards the end of my talk. What are the current field uh, growing right now? Beyond the AI, the data, the pipeline itself, there are two other P words also a uh, critical role in this entire process. That's the people and the policy. People referring to physicians and uh, nurses and who actually help us capture the care experience. And also it refers to the uh, two developers make the electronic medical record easy to use by physician. That's one of the major complaints now by our uh, physician. The EMR is so hard to use, right? So that's the people's role. Policies related standardization. I used to work in industry. I was in working in Lucent. I happen to also be working on MPEG-4. Uh, that's the standard we're using right now for multimedia. Back then, that was the research I do. Uh, so if you think about it, in industry, uh, like uh, in the entertainment industry, we have been adopting standard for a long time. Unfortunately, in the healthcare medical domain, we're only in the baby step right now, uh, far away from being matured. So policy play a critical role. Now, let's actually now take a small step further, talking about what are the AI challenges, why we need a, a important develop the AI algorithm, why also we need to develop the AI algorithm that is robust and usable. So I'm using this simple example to share with you why data experimental design, data collection is so important. So say, now let's talk about the COVID-19, what's happening since last year. If initially you say, I get a healthy population, I have the COVID patient. Say if we're using the data from China, right? We look at the mortality rate. Oh, we're confident we develop a, a tool system, right? We actually fundamentally develop machine learning. We actually get this uh, decision threshold. Medicine itself ultimately is a decision uh, threshold. You have a decision making, you need a threshold. If it's above it, you're sick or below it, you're healthy. Unfortunately now, if you look at the US, what happened, right? We have a, a huge amount, okay. Uh, so this is actually what the decision making is, right? So let's actually, then if you look at uh, uh, what happened in the real world, this data prevalence can change like uh, COVID-19. If we use the data from China to de have a decision shred, we go to the US, it's going to change, right? There's, there are more red here. So how do you actually change this decision structure? That's fundamentally the basic theory of decision theory behind the uh, the AI for medicine. Uh, when you look at the, if it's actually completely linear decision, you can tell a lot of real world cases are very complex. You have a compounded case where healthy and disease are mixed. So that's where you want to use the nonlinear, right? Nonlinear decision uh, surface to separate the two different classes. So that's what you want to accomplish in the AI. So with that, the background information, let me actually now dive into a, the, exactly what's the workflow. We talk about AI, big data, how really it's going to help us. So I want to start using a cancer as the example because the cancer is top three cause of death in the US. If you look at the people who are below 85 years old, cancer is the number one uh, cause of death. If you include the people who are more than 85 years old, and then uh, cardiovascular is still number one. But let's look at cancer as an example. So let's take a look at what's the challenge, why we need uh, AI right now. So if you look at uh, what's the current uh, cancer practice, you have symptom, you go to see doctor. Doctor suspect you have some issue, you go take a, a imaging. Then you see a lump. What do you do next? 
you do a needle biopsy. After you do biopsy, you figure out what kind of uh, uh, cancer stage on the subtype it is, and then you decide to go to a different therapy. If it's a very early stage, you do radiation. If, um, if otherwise, for solid tumor, you do surgery plus chemo. So what are the issues while in the current clinical workflow? So the first thing is, currently in the US alone, every single year, we have more than half million people got cancer. Uh, it's one, no, sorry, more, more than 1.3 million people got cancer. We have uh, more than half million people die from cancer. If we do a uh, math, it's actually more than one person dying per minute. So what exactly the reason? One of the major reason among the people who are dying, one third of those people should not die at all. They die because of poor early detection, be because the patient do not have a, a symptom uh, in early stage. Once it's had a symptom, sometimes it's already late stage. So poor early detection is uh, one of the challenges. What's the other challenge? So this is a surprise to me uh, when I first learned this. This is a, a Emory Pathology uh, Department chief uh, came to me, asked for my help. He presented the challenge to me. He said, once the neotope biopsy is done, this is what they got. They using a staining, looking for biomarker, looking at the nucleus of the cell. Uh, as a result of it, based on how regular the cell is, because if they're healthy, it should be regularly grown. If it's grown widely without any pattern control, that's become a, a tumor. And sometimes it's very aggressive, it become a malignant. That's called a cancer. So he was telling me that one of the major challenges is if you ask a couple of pathology in the same room, looking at the, the same patient biopsy, they can come out with a different diagnosis. The question is how much percentage of the diagnosis are different. To my own surprise, the chief told me it's well, one, well uh, very well known in the uh, cancer pathology. There are about a forty percent inconsistent diagnosis. And now coming to this uh, uh, next stage for therapy, if you actually do a surgery trying to remove the, the tumor from the cancer patient, and then unfortunately. Uh, the measurement right now is a five-year survival after the cancer removal. That's considered a success. If it's actually happened, the cancer came back within five years, that's, that's not a, a successful case. So how much percentage of cancer patient after the cancer surgery will have cancer come back? Again, this came from the surgery, surgery department chief. He told us there are about 47% patient after the cancer removal surgery will have cancer come back. And what's really sad is among the 47% of patient, 92% of patient will have cancer come back within one, 18 months, one half years. So what does that mean for us? It happened to be, and uh, Shuming and I, we actually went to the operating room, uh, looking into the cancer removal. So we actually, uh, for example, for this uh, brain cancer removal, right? Uh, this uh, whole process, if you think about uh, how it happens, it's actually the surgeon has to uh, shave the hair and then uh, using the heating when he start cut, like a cut to stop the bleeding. So there is a smell going on. And then he used the sole to cut the skull and then bring pop out. And then he has to carefully follow the MRI, 3D MRI. However, the brain already deformed. He has to be so careful in how to enter his knife inside the brain to, when he was trying to take the cancer out. That itself has high risk. He may cut the nerve for the eyes, the vision or hearing, and the patient will lose the hearing or sight, right? And so that's, the process, not only that, but also after you, he, the removal itself, the healing itself with the pain, with the headache, with the lingering effect, that itself usually lasts several months to more than half a year. If after you just recovered, then within uh, 18 months, the cancer come back, 
you can think about it, how effective our treatment are. So what exactly the problem? And then we're talking about the chemo. It's the same issue. You take a chemo drug, the patient lose the hair, while meeting have a lot of other issues. It's all come back to a simple, very focused issue. The issue is molecular medicine. When we're actually talking about early diagnosis, molecule level, cell level, there's already has been changes happening at the molecular cellular level. Unfortunately, we cannot see. In the cancer diagnosis time, currently pathologists are based on their training under microscope using their training of art to remember the morphology to do diagnosis. That's why there's big inconsistency because the field of view, when they look into the uh, tissue, is very different, right? So uh, totally heterogeneous for cancer cell growth. So that's why, how do you find the magic biomarker that can differentiate the different morphology in the early stage, especially for cancer biomarker? And then when you come down to this phase for chemo, how do you find the biomarker? So the cancer drug will only be released when it gets to the cancer cell. And also for the surgery, why the cancer came back within 18 months for such high percentage? It's only because when the surgeon was trying to remove the cancer, there are residual left over. The medical imaging cannot see and the surgeon cannot uh, take those out. That's why it grow back. So all these link to the immediate the issue, right? That's what we call the biomarker. So how do we find a molecular marker? We go for molecular medicine, right? So we get to the molecular marker, we can do early diagnosis, we can do better uh, like a pathology subtyping, we can also do a targeted drug delivery for chemo, and also we can remove the surgical margin. So actually, uh, Xu Ming uh, made a presentation uh, last November. If you remember, he's the one developing nanotechnology. We're the one finding the cancer marker. That's why he's one of his major contribution is the molecular imaging for early diagnosis. So another uh, Xu Ming's uh, contribution is to be able to use this uh, biomarker and then look put it into image guided surgery to look for the uh, residual in the margin where you cannot see in the MRI, but you can use the optical the imaging once the surgical region is being opened. Okay. In addition to that, we used to have a, a big center where we also look at the chemotherapy, right, for taxol delivery based on target. So those are among those. Everything on the biomarker, on the pathology, on the uh, targeted drug delivery, those things, that fall into the biomedical health informatics and the need for AI. So back in 2005, uh, Xu Ming, me, and uh, uh, Winter Cancer Institute director, Dr. Jonathan Simon, we initiated and started uh, Georgia Tech Emory uh, Cancer Center for Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence. We're the one addressing this. So. Now, let's actually dive deeper, specifically focusing on AI. So I think by looking, sharing with you what I, I just have, you probably already see exactly where AI come to play a role. AI needed for biomarker. We can find the magic molecule. AI also needed for imaging. So today, I'm going to use imaging to explain the process in more detail, only because imaging is very visual. So I can clearly tell you what are the challenges more clearly. So uh, these are the images for kidney cancer. Uh, this uh, came from, I said, the pathology chief at Emory. So I want to quickly show you, uh, explain uh, uh, two terminology here. Why is it called the subtyping? So what exactly the subtyping mean? So basically it's all kidney cancer. It's all this cancer grow in the kidney. And World Health Organization, based on years of uh, uh, pathologist experience, help them pre-group these different uh, morphology so that uh, in the future, when the new pathology come in, they can quickly uh, use the knowledge they had during the training because each of the morphology 
linked to different prognosis. Some linked to very progressive, uh, aggressive one, people will die immediately. Some linked to a not so aggressive one. So people can have it for many years still alive, right? So, uh, so that's uh, what the subtyping is. The second one though, is the staging. That's a different concept. This is called subtyping, this is staging. So this is related to, uh, once they decided it's a, a particular type, for example, for this one, it's this particular type, clear cell. Then they have to diagnose the patient, which stage they have cancer. Is this a, a early stage or late stage? Late stage, if it's solid tumor, you have to do surgery. Early stage radiation works. So for this case, this is the early stage, this is the late stage. So these are two important uh, uh, concepts. Now, if we start talking about the AI, what's our goal? Our goal, as I already showed you earlier on in the cartoon, our job is when we have a healthy tissue versus a diseased tissue versus the different stages of the cancer, we want to use finding that decision threshold. It can actually, once we find threshold, when new patient data come in, we can use that threshold to quickly decide whether this is a disease cell or healthy cell or which stage it is. That's the fundamental concept behind the, the uh, AI. So now, if we take a look, what exactly, how we're going to do it. So uh, there are multiple technology currently existing in the uh, clinical medicine. One is hematoxylin and allicin, HNDE staining. One is the immunohistochemistry staining for protein. One is the streaming uh, technology, multiplex quantum dot. He and uh, Ali Visatos from Berkeley were the first two people, uh, two groups uh, actually developed a bioconjugated quantum dot. So these are the current technology being utilized. So now we go back to the AI. If you remember this AI flow diagram I showed you early on, let's actually just use that to illustrate the issues. I already said the first step is always related to quality. Second one is uh, a feature extraction, third one, knowledge modeling, next one, last one is a decision, uh, actionable decision making. Let's start with a data quality issue. So this is actually uh, the chief that day, I still remember he was in my office, we were talking about this. He showed me these four uh, like uh, uh, images. He took a CD when he came. And then he asked me, what's my thinking? He already educated me, what is the subtyping? What he is uh, staging, right? The different grade. He asked me what they are. My actually diagnosis, I said, look to me, these are four different subtypes. He told me I was wrong. In fact, it's all the same subtype. Unfortunately, this is the, the real image they got, the real patient behind every image is the patient. He said that this is exactly the problem that's uh, contributed to the diagnosis challenge, 40% uh, inconsistency diagnosis. Uh, so what exactly the issue? The issue are, you can clearly tell the color are different, the size are different, right? So I have my student then work on. We try to look into uh, all these uh, cancer 20, uh, 321 patient. And then I want to see, uh, do they have any pattern? What is it? They're supposed to be exactly the same uh, subtype. They're, uh, however, they do have a different stages, right? So now, so what's the problem? Uh, talking about the data quality issue in the AI. That's why I'm using imaging to illustrate. Let's take a look. So he gave me all this data. I asked my student to take a look at this. I also take a closer look at using the machine learning, the tool we already developed early on for other uh, project, uh, other imaging. So we directly apply to this. Let's take a look at what's the challenge here. So we have a two batch of the uh, data. This is from day one, this is from day two, two different kinds of data. We find out that if we use the day one patient data, I train my AI model. I started predicting the new patient from the same day. I have 83% accuracy. If I do the second day constraint within the same day, I have 86% accuracy. However, if we actually happen to use the second day to develop my AI model, I apply to the first day, it's already dropped to around 44%. Anytime is close to 50%. Uh, we usually joke about it and in AI. We said, uh, that's not AI, monkey can do it, right? So then if you, however, if you look at another case, if I happen to use this first day to do my training my AI model, 
I apply to the second day patient, it's actually I'm doing more harm than helping. It's actually dropped to 14%. So that's exactly the problem for the current medicine. There's so much quality issue. So this is an example to show what the AI has to be do, done first is you need to clean up the quality data, okay? So I'm actually not going to go over this detail, but to tell you that we have to figure out, fix the color issue. We have to fix the size issue. Uh, so that's the first step. Second step, feature extraction. So this is actually biopsy tissue, right? So this is a kidney. They take the, uh, after they cut the kidney out, they make the tissue slide. And the early days, uh, they put the, the glass slide under the microscope, the physician pathologists start looking, they have 40% inconsistency. Now they're using a robot to control the uh, microscope. It takes 24 hours, robot automatically scan, okay? And every single scan is this small patch. They just keep doing this patch by patch, eventually scan the whole thing. This particular uh, tissue has 28,000 by 14.6,000 uh, pixel. And then what exactly what I mean by information extraction. What I mean is you have raw data, but you want to be able to extract the features. You don't want to work on raw data. You want to get a feature. The feature are several different kinds. Some are related to color, some are related to texture, some are related to shape, some are related to topology. I usually group them as a two part. I call it uh, the uh, pixel based and I call it uh, object based. Okay pixel-based, object-based, because I either based on pixel to the processing, or I based on the cell shape, an object to actually do the processing. So let's take a look. The original image is 28,000 by 14.6,000. That's how I describe the image, okay? Now I reduce it to 2,600 features. Right. Originally, when we first uh, did this, we have more than 4,000. But it turned out that the other close to 2,000 are not contribute, contributing to the decision making, the threshold I, I was talking about. So that's why we eventually came down to 2,600 features. So once we have a 2,600 feature, this will be the one we use in decision making. That's a decision surface I show you in the cartoon earlier on happened to be exactly what's happening. We actually now diagnose the cancer versus non-cancer, which stage they are. Now let's mention about uh, knowledge modeling. As I share with you that medicine itself is knowledge intensive. So pathology got trained looking at this, tell you which part is what. Uh, however, for example, the red place is a tumor. Uh, uh, the non-tumor region is healthy and the green one is the tumor, okay? So the challenge though is traditionally a lot of AI system, computer aided system are not using their knowledge. That's why they're not being used. The new trend, we need to use it for knowledge, for the, uh, the their knowledge for training. However, what's the challenge? So this is a reverse engineer problem. We're engineers. We know that sometimes we try to model how the plane stay in the air we need to model the wind, the turbulence, what the how the has changed, the force change. It's the same thing in the AI for biomedicine. We pathology can tell us these are the differences. We need to figure out which math can capture that differences. So that's why it became one of the most challenging uh, topics for the past half century in terms of AI for biomedicine. So a uh, quickly example for us, it's actually took many years effort also to be able to develop some of the model. So this is one simple example to show if we do have been able to find that knowledge model and mathematic model, we can now, uh, by the pathology picking up the region, we can automatically populate the entire tissue slide. And we can like uh, really highlight uh, anything in yellow, that's a tumor, anything in uh, the magenta, that's the necrosis region, and then anything in the uh, pink, that's uh, the uh, cyan, that's the stroma, right? So that's exactly what we are trying to do based on knowledge to separate using the feature. The final stage is a decision. I already showed you the cartoon. So right now, I do want to emphasize a, a very important thing in decision-making. 
as I already said, ultimately decision is related to the metric. So I want to share with you that when you do AI for medicine, one of the major challenge is most of the time we keep talking about accuracy, but accuracy is a terrible metric. If your data set is unbalanced, you have a, like a 90,000 uh, healthy people versus 1,000 uh, diseased people, you use the accuracy, it's going to be completely biased. So that's why on the decision-making phase, finding the right policy is very important. So metric. So that's why if it's unbalanced, you need to use uh, uh, the Matthews correlation coefficient, such metric that's insensitive to the unbalanced data set. Also, there's always a trade-off between sensitivity and the specificity. You need to decide, for example, right now when we're doing a testing, a COVID-19 testing, there's a first phase is to find out whether there is potentially COVID. That's why you care more about the sensitivity. But the second phase, you want to confirm. The confirmation specificity is more important than sensitivity. So in addition to that, I mentioned early on about this uh, uh, the decision, right? Decision is about decision threshold. Metric is important. Another thing is that decision threshold. Uh, let me quickly show you. So if we are using apple to represent the healthy, orange to represent the diseased, after you do all the training, if the prevalence change, what's going to happen? That's what I was mentioning about COVID-19, right? You use Chinese model data last year. You do all the training. You find this is a decision threshold. Unfortunately, now you go to US, everything changed, right? So you need to be able to adapt this decision threshold. That's where was the current uh, modern uh, AI method. We need to develop a robust AI method. That's what uh, this one is referring to. After that, what's next for the AI? The next the most important thing is interpreting the result to support AI model. So in that regard, uh, one of the major challenges in AI for medicine is, for example, for pathology, why I specifically select the pathology uh, image to illustrate this whole pipeline is because at least I can show you something in the image, you can see it, right? For example, among the 2,600 features, there are only these few features in terms of color. I can differentiate the clear cell, papillary, chromophobe, oncocytoma subtype, right? So if we're actually having other cases, a lot of features such as entropy, uh, many of us working in engineer, we know what entropy is. It's very good uh, feature. Unfortunately, pathology will not validate and support that results. So that's become another issue called the interpretable AI. That's another issue, okay? So that's the reason why only if a pathology validate, you can start using the tool. They start trying, uh, uh, trusting your tool. They are going to use it. But ultimately, that's not enough. We have to go back to uh, the biology test. For example, for our uh, Georgia Tech Emory uh, Cancer Technology Center for this kidney cancer, after like a close to three years of exploration, we find out a, a biomarker, not only through all the AI analysis, but also through the uh, PCR analysis. And the, finally, then we give to Shumin. Shumin's team getting uh, 64 new patients uh, blend. We don't know what's the label, only pathology now. We are trying our technology. So we're using this biomarker we find. We actually doing the staining and this is the harsh reality. Basically, among 64, we have a, a, like a six wrongly diagnosed. So this is just to tell you that how challenged it is right now when we're actually doing a biomedical AI uh, because the mistake for make, making the AI mistake is the cost is very high. It's life and death situation. So that's another reason why AI is growing right now. But what's the bright side of AI? The bright side of AI is AI provide precision. We have never seen before. This again is coming from pathology chief. So what they told us is, use, this is the ovarian cancer, right? So they said it used to be, they look at these two, right? Under the microscope, they said this one, is, both of them are grade three, uh, that's all. Now, because of the AI, we can actually detailly highlight it, okay? And we can actually report that for uh, the two patients, different patients, 
This patient uh, have a 3% lymphocyte, 15% necrosis, 85% tumor. But this one have 95% uh, tumor, 5% stroma, and 60% lymphocyte, right? So we suddenly have more insight uh, precision on our diagnosis. So that's what the precision medicine is. So that's the bright side of AI. So now, what exactly the opportunity for AI, besides what I said about the uh, precision, it's also provide objectivity. If you're actually using AI to develop the algorithm, this 40% inconsistency among pathologists are significantly reduced. So in addition to that, what else? So this is another issue. That's really the quality, right? Now I'm just talking about the AI opportunity for medicine health. So I'm talking about the, for the clinical record, medical record, we have terrible clinical notes. We have a, a quality, a subjective uh, uh, writing, and then we have a 25%, 30% missing data. And uh, so then this is another experiment. This is, a <laughs> I apologize, I should take off the sound. So this one is uh, uh, to related to the uh, bioinformatics, right? Again, this is from our uh, uh, CCNE, the center. Uh, so we are showing that a lot of the biomarker, we want the biomarker, but 90% of the biomarker, which actually use the traditional AI, are not uh, validated because the data are dirty. This is an example, again, for real data. Uh, behind every chip is a patient. We see there are so many different issues, okay? So I want to show you that. Uh, what's the challenge for the quality? Because the, the DNA chip has all these uh, aerosol, scratch, spattering, as a result of it, all the worm, small worm you see here, happen to be the biomarker, they cannot be verified in the clinical practice. So that's the reason why right now, one of the major uh, challenge is the quality. This is a very mind-boggling statistic from CDC. It used to be cancer, heart disease, and uh, uh, like uh, uh, lung disease are the top three cause of death for the US. Unfortunately, now the medical error become the number three, top three cause of death in the US. So one of the major issues is, can we use AI to address this quality issue? Because some of the issue when you have redundancy in your data, you can use the AI through redundancy, reduce such uh, data. So that's one important opportunity. Another opportunity. Uh, so right now, we, because of COVID-19 pandemic, we know that in the US, we have such a high mortality. What if I tell you one of the major challenges we have in US right now, we have 57 jurisdictions in the US alone. Unfortunately, we're having 57 jurisdictions that all our health record, the death record for our population are not following the same standard. So that's why CDC is the one pushing, using through the pandemic, the, there's more urgent need to using harmonization, using develop a standard uh, for this, addressing this global challenge. By the way, this is not only the US, it's also entire world. So as a result of the CDC approach to the Georgia Tech and the GTRI, so we're the one right now helping them develop uh, using the HO7, fast health uh, interoperability resource, a new standard to be able to uh, make all the state, the uh, population data are uh, interoperable to each other. So next thing is uh, integration. I think uh, I'm almost done. Oh, uh, I had a quick question for you. Yes. On the on the medical errors uh, that are now number three, is that yes. predominantly because of uh, missing diagnoses until it's too late, or is it incorrect diagnoses resulting in wrong treatment, or, or is there something else? Uh, both. Both. Okay. Uh, so wrongly diagnosis or misdiagnosis, uh, some are related to what I showed you early on because the subjectivity on the physician. Uh, some are related to the medical insight that was not properly uh, shared. So that's like uh, related to that. But there's also another type of uh, uh, error. That's uh, simply caused, uh, for example, the physician's note. And uh, one time I, in a meeting, we invited a parent who came give a talk. He's 
daughter was killed because uh, the nurse reading the physician's prescription and uh, because of the poor handwriting. And so he, the nurse put the wrong dosage and killed the, the kid, right? So that's why it's both. It's a, some are really just a medical error. Some are uh, some insights now being shared. Uh, some uh, actually believe or not is a standardization issue. This is another big headache because now different uh, biotechnology, different instrumentation, they measure the uh, same property, but they have different unit. Uh, but when people are looking over those, uh, especially for new technology, they didn't pay attention. Is that a nano mall or is a nano leader? Uh, they mess up with that. As a result of it, that's also killed people. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so that's a, so that's why I said this is a very mind-boggling, right? Um, yeah. So, um, I anyway. So, it, it, what did Steve just asked me question remind me of something happened to my family. Uh, it's very uh, tragic, also because of this. But but we're going to continue. So the next uh, issue is uh, integration, right? So I talk about it. right now. I'm talking about what's the AI opportunity. AI because of the redundancy in some of the data capturing, so we can use AI to help us improve uh, the data quality. And then second one because uh, we have a, a data sitting in silo. Uh, so that's why we can use uh, data harmonization. That's part of the AI initiative to harmonize the data to improve the AI development. And the third one is the integration, right? So for example, for the cancer patient diagnosis, traditionally what's happening, uh, you have a clinical diagnosis, uh, that's the clinical factor. You have a, a biopsy, right? Then you do diagnosis. But we know there are 40% inconsistency. So right now, we're using AI. We're no longer into looking into a small patch. We're using the whole slide image and uh, a market, and then reduce the subjectivity uh, to improve uh, the objectivity, right, on the diagnosis. On top of that, there's a big push for medical genomics, right? That's what's going on right now. We actually just recently published a paper with FDA. Uh, we are asked by FDA to help. Is in medical genomic, right? So in the medical genomic, we look at uh, all the molecular uh, profile, and then jointly all together, we go back looking into the uh, prediction, right? To predict the survival of the patient, and then to get out what's the best treatment. So that's why this is another uh, important uh, initiative. An opportunity going on. Okay, now uh, I'm going to, while I'm talking on this topic, I want to quickly mention about this uh, medical genomic uh, issue and the ch uh, challenge for AI. So basically, uh, after the 1999 Human Genome Project is done, that was by Sanger sequencing, the traditional sequencing. It takes many years, it's very expensive to do it, right? Then we fast forward. We develop the uh, microarray, DNA chip, a uh, speed up. But then during that process, we still continually develop a, a sequencing because sequencing can help you get to all your billion base pair of everyone, right? So we can know the exactly the genetic uh, uh, makeup. So what are the challenges? When you actually finally get the next generation, the second generation sequencing done after, uh, right? This is around uh, uh, five, six years ago. So this is what's the challenge. The challenge is once the data is available, because of 23andMe, because there's so many people working on bioinformatics, develop software tools. Uh, but So that's why a lot of people want to say, hey, I'm going to pay a few thousand dollars, get myself sequenced. Now I want to see what's happening. Then everyone starts finding out. This is a, one of the major challenge they're facing. There's so many tools. They do not know which tool help them get the right results because the different tool give a different result. What do you trust? So this is actually one of the issues the FDA is, was facing too. So they suddenly got all these different uh, places submitted diagnosis kit now based on the uh, DNA, the sequencing, right? Or then uh, some exactly the same cancer. They're using different platform. Why is it using Lumina? Why is it using uh, Roche? And then they find out that they find a different number of marker and they do not know which one to trust. So that's why FDA uh, put together an international consortium. There are 36 teams from around the world, 
all uh, continents. And then uh, among which they're looking into, are these next generation sequencing technology reproducible to each other, right? Uh, what are they sensitive to? Uh, so among different tasks, we at Georgia Tech, we are actually being chartered to look into the uh, algorithm. Yeah. So uh, for example, if we have the, uh, they are the one, FDA paid a, a couple million uh, dollar, get the uh, patient sample. Uh, these are cohort of patients who are, have no outcome. In addition to that, the FDA designed the benchmark uh, assay. They give to a different uh, a company, right? Uh, BGI, um, like they, they collected it initially from uh, Illumina, Roche, Life Technology. There's a fourth one who dropped out later. After the data got, uh, got after they do the sequencing, and then we start looking at this. So they have three sequencing platform and they're asking us from the base pair, can we actually get a gene as a form exon? And then at that time, there are 14 popular uh, algorithms mapping the uh, billion base pair and to the uh, reads, okay? So that's why there's so many of those. And then we do, some have a spliced uh, mapping, the tool has it, some do not have, right? And then some handle multiple hands, some do not handle. Uh, then after that, uh, you do all the processing. Then you start doing the quantification, normalize it, find out the differential expression. Eventually, you got to this uh, a transcript term. That's when you finally look into biomarker. Remember I was talking about biomarker? You have to do all these uh, process to get there, right? How many possibilities with all these uh, uh, choices? That's, I want to show you, that's exactly what's the challenge, right? 21,000, okay? Uh, 210,000, uh, 17,000 possibility, right? So that's why what FDA want to know, what can be done? So we are the one team lead uh, this effort. There are multiple efforts. We're the leading the algorithm effort. So we have shown that indeed, this is as, as I share with you, this is the real uh, patient data. We know exactly the patient is alive or death, right? Uh, this is what I did, we collected and give to us. We find out that if you happen to use, this is a real data, okay, real, real outcome. But when we are actually utilizing the our algorithm, the AI, by changing one parameter, you get a complete opposite results. What traditionally can be separable cases, you can no longer separable. This just shows you one of the major challenges right now, which is, can we trust the AI algorithm? In the future, if you actually doing diagnosis based on the AI algorithm, if the patient die, who are responsible? The physicians or the AI algorithm developer? So this become a challenge. Meanwhile, it's also an opportunity. So next one, uh, correlation versus uh, causal inference. When we go to see doctor, what do, who do we want to see? We usually want to see a senior doctor, right? Uh, why? Because of experience, that's our intuitive reaction, right? But the reality is, it's more than experience itself. It's actually the inference the doctor is making in his mind, right? Because for a junior doctor who has limited experience, the, the inference of decision-making is different from a senior doctor, right? Who can extrapolate, uh, the, especially with the out norm, okay? However, majority of AI algorithm are still based on the correlation, right? Only less than 5% AI algorithm over the years, again, for more than half a century now, are relying on a causal, right? Because this is such a high, hard computing program. It's actually a, a like uh, we have to use, uh, uh, if we're using Bayes network to model the causal inference, we have to, it's incomplete, NP incomplete. It's a very hard uh, computing program. So let me show you what I mean by this, right? The correlation is not equal to causal inference. So this is the epidemiology study. Uh, this is related to women who are taking combined hormone replacement therapy. And the conclusion back then was reported was they have a lower than average coronary heart disease. So that's the uh, report. 
Okay, that's based on correlation. You have all this correlation. Uh, so that's why they draw a conclusion early on saying, hey, you know what? The HRT protects against the, against the uh, coronary heart disease, CHD. However, what's the real word, uh, the real reason? After the random controlled trial were done, it's actually showing that that's not true at all. Huh? So basically, HRT cost small and significant increase of CHD is the opposite of the early report. So what's exactly the reason though? The reason is the early one was done based on the correlation study, okay? However, after random trial, they find that this is the opposite. But now they go back and find out what's the real cause. This is what they finally find that what's the real cause. The real cause find out that the women who are using HRT happen and most likely are really coming only from the higher social economic groups. So they have much better than average diet and exercise, right? So that's why they have a lower coronary heart disease. But in general case, that's not true at all. It's the opposite. So that's why correlation is definitely not equal to causal inference. Causal, the finding the true cause become one of the hardest challenge right now we're facing. Uh, so right now, uh, even though the US uh, NIH supported a national center on this, the progress is still limited. When we say there's a challenge, we, we can also at the same time feel there's huge opportunities remain to be explored. So now, with that, I want to now summarize what are the challenges and opportunities of AI and big data for public health. The first one is definitely quality control. As I share with you now, it's the number three cause of death in the US and also very high in the world. So that's why we need to figure out how to do that, okay? Second one is integration. I mentioned that traditional pathology is based on the morphology image and now we want to combine with the AMIC. In fact, there's already a novel technology existing called imaging mass spectrometry. The only thing is it's destructive. We can use that to better identify uh, the imaging biomarker, not just bio the molecular marker, but also for imaging purpose using this technology, but still very useful. And then now there's already a lot of system being developed now trying to compare EHR with the imaging, with the sequencing to give a better diagnosis. Going forward right now with COVID-19 going on, there's a big push now. We have to go use the personal health, uh, home monitoring, right? Go beyond the, uh, the hospital monitoring. So that's why there's a big future for data integration. The next one is a causal inference. This one, as I share with you, this by far is the hardest one going on right now. So there's many, many things remain to be discovered in this field. The next one is real-time care decision-making. So this is related to what I share with you. When you have COVID-19, early data uh, collection versus later uh, disease outbreak, uh, it's very different. How you can still do the real-time decision-making. You do use the model you trained based on millions of people in the past, but you have to correct it real time, make the right decision, okay? And the last one, interoperable AI. This is also what I mentioned that. For physician to trust your system, they have to validate how we actually make physician understand the AI algorithm. So that's become one of the major issues going on. And also it presents a huge opportunity at this moment. Comparing to causal inference, uh, right now, the uh, uh, advancement in the other four is a faster in the third one. And then among the other the four, I would say the algorithm development for addressing data quality is making a huge like a progress. Unfortunately, standardization is still very slow and limited. So that's why we have to continue work on that. So what are the national opportunities? So right now there are quite a few uh, initiatives going on in the US, the brain initiative, cancer moonshot, uh, mental health uh, initiative. So those are the national uh, opportunity right now. That's why uh, there's a big push 
we are utilizing the AI to address all these uh, uh, issues. Uh, especially with the uh, aging society, there's a big push to utilize AI. So we can early do more prevention, do more health promotion. So with that, let me actually summarize. So basically, going forward, what's exactly the role of AI? The role is related to paradigm shift. We want to move from sick, sick care to healthcare. Uh, we used to call, have, call it healthcare, but really it has been sick care. Now we really want to go to into the healthcare. So we want to go from a reactive to proactive, go from reverse engineer to preventive health, right? So that's why in this process, biomedical engineer provide more technology, have point of care devices, acquire the data, so they become the basis for the evidence medicine. But more importantly, go beyond that, we need to actually make sense of data. By 2030, in US alone, we're going to reach to utabytes of the data. Utabyte is a physics term. It's referring to 24 zeros, right? So this is how much data we're talking about in US alone. So that's why a few years back, I was invited to an NSF discussion panel. So we're talking about what are the opportunities. So why is AI for big data? Why is modeling? Why is a human computer interaction? So specifically on for AI for big data, what exactly the vision and the roadmap? So this is a goal we're trying to go. We want to actually eventually go because of paradigm shift. We want to actually monitor our uh, health, doing the health promotion, capture the information, right? And then combine it with molecular, right? So can we do early diagnosis? Knowing the marker, start doing the early monitoring, and then go to the imaging. Imaging not only the pathology, uh, radiology, but also behavior imaging. I mentioned earlier on in the Institute of People and Technology, we're in the middle of already developing the behavior imaging for obesity people, uh, take a picture of their food, calculate how many cal calorie intake. And so that's how we're doing it. Then we build a network to make all the connections, right? Ultimately, I made this logo, this is uh, for my lab. It has a meaning, right? Buzz is a Georgia Tech. A mascot engineer, and uh, uh, we are the one uh, used to have uh, devices, but now we are wearing the stethoscope, uh, getting into medicine, and then combining with the Schumann's molecular technology, and then put on devices that deliver to the user, right? Ultimately, that's how we accomplish uh, for this. In this whole process of why we're doing it, the P health, I do want to re emphasize again AI is not only for population. It's also for individual, because for individual, we have a heterogeneous multiple type of data. That's why we want to be able to use integration to integrate together. So that's my major summary slides. But I also, because I come from a university, I do want to share the opportunity for some of you who are considering a career for yourself or your relative, your children, so definitely right now, there's a big need and growth in the health uh, AI, health IT and biomedical AI. So uh, this is a, coming from uh, the, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Shalif, who is a considered founding father of uh, uh, biomedical or informatics, and Bruce Wheeler, who is the past president of uh, uh, IEEE NBS. So we're looking at what's happening, available positions opening. Uh, it's, it turned out that uh, the, all the positions in the biomedical engineer for the whole year is less than the opening in the health IT and the biomedical health AI uh, one month. So that's why it's absolutely worth uh, uh, considering. So in addition to that, I also want to quickly share with you uh, what are the emerging community that's uh, fast growing right now. Under the uh, IEEE, uh, Steve is an IEEE member, I'm also an IEEE member. We have Engineering, Medicine, and Biology Society. Uh, 2012, uh, we started renaming our journal to be a journal of BHI, and now the impact factor is already made it in the number one uh, in informatics journal in the field. I'm the senior editor for that journal. And over the years, right now, our conference also grow uh, from uh, like a traditionally smaller conference. Now it's a high standard conference. 
In addition to that, uh, ACM, this is computing community, they did the same thing. They just celebrated the 11th years uh, for forming this uh, community. It's also fast growing. Uh, in addition to that, engineering uh, community uh, also started NSF, right? Started a Smart Connect Health with a new journal. What I really also want to highlight is this particular community, AI Med. This community actually was driven by physicians in the US and around the world because there's a huge need to revolutionize medical care, right? To bring the technology to as an assistance tool to support a decision so that we can reduce the subjectivity, reduce the error. So with that, I want to finally mention a last important thing is getting to each of us. So this is actually a simple example to show. I mentioned about the P, medicine. There's one important P word is called the participatory. Can we participate? I actually want to tell you, yes. This is one example to show my student. We were actually training pediatric patients. These are the patients uh, born with genetic disease, sickle cell disease. Uh, growing their ears used to be taken care of by their parents. Now we are handing, handling them uh, tools so they can actually take care of themselves, right? So my student was teaching them how to use the, the uh, gadget. This is a computer from my lab, which went to the uh, D uh, summer camp uh, for the kids. And we teach them how to write down how they're handling their episode, the pain attack, so they can actually take care of themselves while they're at school, right? So that's why it's indeed the real societal impact that coming from AI is for real. So with that, I'm finishing up my uh, presentation. I know it took a long time, uh, but I hope this is a, a useful and uh, uh, to you. And this is my contact information. And thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, May. I'm not sure if you can hear me well. Some folks online have said they can't hear me. Oh, I can hear you very well, yes. Okay, all right, so I'm not sure what's going on then, but uh, I don't see any more questions. Folks, if you have any other questions, uh, please go ahead and get them in now. We'll give you just another minute. I know there was a lot there to try and digest. Uh, just so you know, May, there was a little bit of back and forth among some of the the audience, um, but it wasn't specifically a direct question for you. So it was just it was a nice little conversation going on, basically. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, like I already said, uh, uh, I'm just trying to bring uh, what's going on in the biomedical AI and big data, and uh, hopefully this is it become useful information for you. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, we, we're getting some, uh, you know, words of appreciation, excellent presentation, thank you, that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, a lot of information there. Uh, I think it presents a lot of hope for the future uh, for everybody. <laughs> so yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it pans out for all. Uh, thank right. you. Yep, thank you very much again questions. for inviting me. Yep, thank <laughs> you very much for doing this for us. And, uh, this will be out there for everybody to see afterwards as well. So uh, thank you all. Um, next uh, month, next March. Uh, so again, second Monday, same time. Uh, unless things change radically in the world uh, between now and then, I plan on it being uh, strictly live on YouTube like this. Uh, just so everybody knows, we are looking at, uh, even when we do go back to in-person meetings, continuing to doing a uh, online portion as well in parallel. So uh, for those who can't make it and got accustomed to this, uh, we'll have an option for you as well. So with that, uh, I hope everybody has a good night and a good rest of the month. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.